This video is going to be a brief introduction to the topic of fairness in machine learning. I'll start by encouraging you to watch a video that was produced by CNBC that reports on law enforcement and how it's beginning to use these automated systems that are based on machine learning to make various decisions. The video discusses how decisions such as sentencing or allocation of police resources can be aided by machine learning algorithms. But these machine learning algorithms have to train from data that comes from systems that may not be perfectly unbiased. And this particular case of where it involves law enforcement is one where machine learning, if it's applied in a way that's not careful, that's not being carefully evaluated for fairness, can have major, obvious, life-changing consequences. But, but this is going to be uh, the case for many other applications of machine learning, even for you know, the more uh, typical sort of web browsing experience machine learning. That's one of the more popular uses in the market today. Um, you know, the possibility of any groups of people or individuals being systematically mistreated by the algorithm or not mistreated, but just not even just mistreated, but but even treated not as well as other people uh, could produce potentially dangerous consequences that that's not really the intent of the deployers of the systems, right? These people are deploying these machine learning systems to improve the experience of the people involved in the system. Um, whether to make the streets more safer or to improve your experience on an online marketplace. You know, if, you're, if you deploy that system and a certain group of individuals, whether it be social groups defined by race or gender or, or groups based on what types of genres of music they like to listen to, if certain groups are, being, are, are giving a, given a worse experience because of the machine learning algorithm, that's something we want to correct for. So the plan for this discussion that we'll have, or this, this video, is that I'm going to go over some of the different forms and causes of unfairness in machine learning. And then we'll go into a few case studies of recent solutions for fairer machine learning. So this will be methods that either post-processed predictions coming out of a model to try to achieve equal opportunity, uh, or methods that do something called fair representation learning, or methods that fix feedback loops in deployed machine learning. This should give you a sample of some of the things people are working on in this space. But there's a lot of different problems that arise that, and new solutions that are being proposed for these problems. So I'm only just going to give you a, a small fraction of what's going on, but maybe it'll give you a, be a nice primer for your own continue, continued reading into this topic area. So there are a variety of, ty of types of fairness we might aim for uh, when we talk about machine learning. And some of these are more appropriate than others for certain applications. So it really depends on, you know, for certain applications, some types of unfairness make sense. And for others, other, others make sense. So it's important to have a bunch of different formal definitions of these types of unfairness so that we can mathematically try to assess them and then come up with methods to reduce their the unfairness that can result from not achieving these forms of fairness. So I'll talk about a bunch of these. So one of them is going to be called un unawareness. Uh, one of them is called group prediction parity. The other is group error parity. Uh, then we'll have individual counterfactual fairness, which is a mouthful, uh, and then something called envy-free fairness. So let's go through each thing. So for unawareness, we're going to have this kind of definition. So we'll start with the basic machine learning setup or, or a supervised learning setup. Or to be even more precise, there's actually no learning in this, in this slide. It's just about prediction. So it's, it's more of a prediction task. So we have data. That's the input. And we're going to call it x and, and, and some output y, which is our target. And we're specifically going, specifically going to have some sensitive feature, um, which I wrote here feature, but it really could be features. But these are these are attributes that are part of the data, part of X, the data, that we want to avoid making decisions based on. So for example, this might be something like gender. Right? If you're trying to predict whether somebody will be a good candidate for a job opening, you want to make sure that that 
candidacy is not affected by the person's gender uh, or other attributes like age or race or, or where they grew up or any of these attributes that have nothing to do with their actual ability to perform the job and some of which have some you know, legally protected statuses. So the typical approach for achieving unawareness is something that turns out doesn't actually work. And that's this idea that you, you could just train a model uh, that, that uses only the features that are not part of S. So essentially, uh, if you think of X as the set of features that are not sensitive and S as the set of features that are sensitive, you could just train a model using X and ignore S. Uh, and then that would be like training a model on, on all the attributes of a person aside from its, that person's gender. So this usually fails because there are going to be features in X that are correlated with S. So you can think of it as the machine learning model might learn a predictor for S and then use S to predict Y. That's not precisely what happens, right? It's, it's not really directly learning a predictor for S. But if that information is there, if there's some correlation between X and S, then we could learn that type of correlation. So an improved version of this is something called group prediction parity. And this is the idea that the learned model should treat two subpopulations the same. Or, or you could extend this to multiple subpopulations. But the point is that if you have two subpopulations, one where the sensitive feature is one and the other where the sensitive feature is zero, so for example, if the sensitive feature might be an indicator function of whether the person is uh, 30 years older or 30 years old or old older uh, or or whether they are are younger than 30 years then that would be uh, a, a essentially a sensitive feature that separates people into age groups and we would learn an f like a, a predictor f such that the expected value of f is going to be equal for either subgroup right either s is older or s is younger so in other words, the prediction probability has similar statistics for groups with or without the sensitive feature. So that's that's reasonably good. And that's actually, you know, if we can achieve this, which is itself is a challenge, this gets us quite a bit uh, of an improvement over not doing any fairness in our machine learning at all. A variation on this is something called group error parity, which uh, is an umbrella term for a lot of different ideas, but the, the, the idea, the main concept here is that we want to not just treat, so the previous idea, this idea of uh, group prediction parity is that your predictions should behave similarly for the different groups. And that might not be a good idea if the groups have inherently different behavior. So instead, the group error parity is trying to make sure that the errors that we make on each subgroup uh, or each, sub, each subpopulation are roughly the same, the same rates. They occur at the same rates. In other words, the prediction error is independent of the sensitive feature S. So this is uh, a flexible idea because the idea of error can be defined in multiple ways. So if the error is defined as something called uh, the pr true positive rate, which is uh, when you the, the predictor or for anybody who should be labeled positive, like their true label is positive, how frequently does the predictor predict true positive in that case? So that's that's this idea. Then then you get this idea of equal opportunity, right? The individuals who so for example, if you have a, a prediction for loan applications, right? You might be predicting whether somebody will pay back their loan. Uh, then this idea of having equal true positive rate means that individuals who deserve loans regardless of their gender or race or age or whatever the sensitive feature may be, uh, the individuals who deserve loans are all equally likely to be offered the loan. So that's group error parity. So there was a very important study that came out a couple years ago on the error rates of gender classification uh, models based on face images. Now, putting aside the fact that gender classification by itself is a major problematic idea, um, if you're going to have that system, it should be, at least it would be nice for it to be accurate. That is, 
all the problems that having a system like this might introduce would be reduced if the, the errors were uh, reduced. Now, what the study examined is how frequently are errors made for individuals in different social groups. And specifically, they were looking at uh, people who are, were marked as male or female and whether their skin was lighter or darker. And what they found was that the, uh, the groups are treated quite differently by, this, by the, these uh, commercial face analysis algorithms. Right? The one came from Microsoft, one came from IBM, and this other one was from, from, uh, called Face++, which I'm not sure which company um, produced that software. But these are com commercial software tools that you can install into the apps that you're building to do gender identification. And when these researchers studied their error rate, the error rates of these methods, they found that there was a reasonably large error uh, gap between the error rates of lighter skinned individuals versus darker skinned individuals. But moreover, and more importantly, if you look at the title of the paper, uh, they found that women with darker skin would frequently receive a significantly lower uh, quality prediction using these software tools. So this is an important study because it identified that not only is there uh, a lack of error consistency across the subgroups, but also that that if you drill down and look at different you know intersections of subgroups, whether you know whether it be the, the uh, skin shade versus uh, gender, um, you will discover even smaller subgroups that are just cons consistently uh, receiving more error than other groups. So this is one of these studies, one of these many studies that is, that's identifying these problems. And it's important to, for us as machine learning experts to go out and, and test for these things while we, or before we go ahead and deploy these tools and expect them to work in ways that we want. Right? We don't want this type of behavior. We don't want um, our machine learning or our software tools to systematically create a worse experience for certain people just because of some irrelevant attribute about them. Okay, moving on to the next type of unfairness or of fairness, we'll talk about individual counterfactual fairness. So this is the idea that uh, a prediction algorithm should treat each individual the same regardless of the sensitive features. So this is a little bit more specific to the individuals than it is about different groups, right? We, we've talked about different groups, but in this case, we, we want it such that for every single individual, we want to learn an f of x S, right, so a function that takes in both the features and the sensitive features, uh, it, it should learn one of these fu predictor, predictor functions such that if you change that sensitive feature and any other correlated features that would change if you were to change the sensitive feature, that the prediction would not change. So this is a really challenging idea because it, it's difficult to map out exactly what other features in X would be affected by the change in S. So this is something that is a great goal to keep in mind, but it requires uh, causal reasoning, which is a, a major frontier in machine learning these days. But it's an important goal to have. All right, the last type of unfairness, or the last type of fairness I want to talk about is envy-free fairness. And this is another type of what's called an individual fairness, where we want to talk about fairness between different individuals. And it's not about the groups, right? just like counterfactual unfairness is not, it's just about each individual changing the sensitive attribute. Envy free fairness is about, uh, in a specific type of setting where we're doing something like resource allocation, uh, we want to define an assignment of resources such that every single individual is as happy as they can be uh, compared to every other individual. In other words, no individual wants to swap with another individual. So this this type of situation can occur. I mean, in the in the in the basic setting, it's it's uh, if everyone has the same preferences, then it's just making sure everyone gets the same amount of of uh, a material. Right? If everybody just wants the same amount of money and you just get, distribute the money evenly, then everyone's happy and everyone's equally happy. But when people have different preferences, it gets more interesting, right? So if you have uh, you know, for example, I, I wrote cake cutting. Uh, so if you, have, if you have different parts of the cake 
and some of it, some of the parts have different types of frosting or different types of uh, uh, toppings on top of it. Uh, you would want to distribute those toppings ac- according to what people prefer. And you might actually have a scenario where you give a smaller slice of cake to one individual, but they have the nicer topping that they that they really like. Uh, or even you might have a bigger slice with the, with the topping, and maybe if the other individual doesn't like that type of topping, then they might still consider it consider it fair. Or the same is true of you know assigning chores, right? Nobody likes to do chores. Well, most people don't like to do chores. So one way to assign a fair amount of chores is to make sure everyone does the same amount of work. But if there's something that somebody really doesn't like, uh, then you can assign a small amount of that to that person. Or rather, if the other people don't like that task, then assigning a small amount to that person would mean no one else would still rather have that job. Right? If nobody likes, uh, you know, cleaning the bathtub, uh, then you assign, you know, I don't know, you, you clean half of the bathtub, and no one will want to swap with you because nobody wants to even touch the bathtub. I don't know. Okay, that's not the, the most clean example. No pun intended. But the point is that once people have different preferences, you can have more interesting splits that are not just completely even. And then if a machine learning algorithm is doing this allocation, then you would want to measure this, you know, the, the quality of the assignment that they're, they're giving. Okay, so those are goals, right? The, the, these are different. Those are what, uh, what I just discussed, envy free fairness and um, counterfactual fairness, uh, error parity, group prediction parity. These are all... You know, positive things we want. But what causes machine learning alg- algorithms to fail to meet these criteria? So here's an incomplete list of some possible causes. So one of the causes and one of the more obvious causes is the fact that the machine learning is learning from data. And so if the data comes from an unfair system, then, then it's joint going to mimic that unfairness. So th- this is commonly cited as the danger for like law enforcement based methods or based machine learning. So if you have machine learning that's training from law enforcement and law enforcement in the past maybe has been subject to uh, bias, then all we're going to do is learn that bias back. But other causes can occur too, right? Not just having, the, even if the data seems fair, you can have, uh, you can have other causes. So, uh, so you can develop unfairness because the definition of a machine learning task is unfair in itself. Right, so you might have a classification task. So you know, I think the the gender classification is a great example of this. Right, gender classification is hugely problematic because gender uh, gender expression changes wildly across cultures, and you know, many systems for gender classification use a binary system, which is just all wrong. Um, and you know, so there's a lot of problems with how you even define the idea of the machine learning task. If you call it a classification, that might be wrong. Right. That maybe you actually need to continuous value representation, or you know maybe you need a multi-dimensional representation. Uh, you know whatever you do, there's a good chance that you might be mischaracterizing the actual thing you want to do if you're not careful. Uh, so aside from that, even if you you know correctly define the right problem and if the data is fair, uh, you might have underrepresentation of minority groups, and then we can you can see you can, you can imagine how that might work, right? Machine learning is often uh, trying to minimize the overall performance right on the entire data set. So it's going to pay more attention to the majority group but by, by you know by nature. Uh, so if there's some minority group in your data uh, and it's not highly represented, it's going to be lower priority in when the machine learning model tries to fit you know its performance. And then lastly, there's this issue of feedback loops in deployed machine learning, which we'll, we'll talk about um, in, we'll, uh, we'll look at a solution that tries to address this problem. So this is the, is the issue that, you know, when the machine learning model makes predictions, that actually causes some people to be happy and some people to be upset, right? The people who are upset will like, or may stop using the service that you're using this mach- machine learning in. And then they become even less represented in the data. And, th- and this will cause this feedback loop that uh, can make systems get more and more unfair over time. So. Looking at these different ta- uh, types of uh, causes, the, the data from unfair systems is, you know, you know, there's a couple examples of those, like things like academic or professional performance or salaries or crime. These are things where there's well-documented biases in, uh, in these existing systems. So if we train to learn from the past, we're just going to replicate the past, which we're trying to fix, right? As a society, uh, pretty much around the globe, every society is trying to work on making these things more fair. 
So in that case, if we use machine learning to learn to replicate old data, it, it could be a step back. It, you know, we, get, we use more technology, which is great, but we end up doing things socially more old-fashioned and inherit all the problems that we had in the past that we're trying to correct. Um, with unfair problem definitions, I already mentioned that there, you know, there are things like that you might want to try to predict that just aren't really clearly defined. Um, and if they don't have anything to do with your input data, your machine learning will just learn correlations that maybe it shouldn't learn. And then with the issue of underrepresentation, this is a nice picture by uh, Moritz Hart. Uh, you can I encourage you to read this blog post by him. Um, so if you look at maybe you have this problem where you have the majority class uh, of of individuals, which is represented on the left, and then a minority in the middle, um, and they have sort of very different behavior, right? They're, they're the, what classify, what separates the pluses from the dots uh, is quite different in the majority and the minority, but if you stick them all together and you try to learn the model, the, uh, the majority is going to overwhelm the minority, and you're going to end up learning something that's very close to the predictor on the left, and that completely uh, underserves the minority group. And then this last feedback loop thing I mentioned was is the idea that the machine learning algorithm will affect the user population, which then affects the user data. And then that in in you know deployed machine learning systems, that is usually that user data is usually used to retrain the model. So your model, if there's any unfairness, might cause people to um, quit the system, uh, or in in industry we call this churn, right? So people might leave the service uh, if the predictions made by the machine learning portion of the service are bad. Um, and then the people who leave the service become a minority. They become an even stronger minority. So even if there's a, like a slightly unfair system at the, be at the beginning, it might get more and more unfair as more iterations of this loop occur. So I want to talk about uh, some case studies of recent solutions for fairer machine learning. So now that we talked about the general ideas, let's talk about some specific solutions that people have talked, have, have, have attempted to propose and study. So the first one is this uh, research by Moritz Hart again, Eric Price, and Nathan Cerebro, um, on essentially it's a post-processing approach that 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 takes predictions from a model and, and chooses thresholds for those predictions or uh, manipulates the predictions to make them more fair or to achieve something what they call equal opportunity. So the, the blog post that I link here does a great job explaining this, but the basic idea is that you can consider a running example of a, of a bank trying to decide whether to give out loans to individuals who apply for the loan. And here's one possible case where you might have some, you know, the, the individuals have credit scores and you can just base your, your, your uh, uh, decision on the credit scores. So on the left, you have the clean case where the, the two uh, bell curves represent the people who would default on the loan and the people who would pay back the loan. So essentially, in this case, you could just threshold at 50 and say, anyone with, anyone with a credit score greater than 50 we should give a loan to, and anyone below 50, we shouldn't give a loan to because they, would, they won't they would even pay us back. So that's a little unrealistic, though. So in, in, uh, on the right, on part B, we have the overlapping categories case where we can't simply threshold. Or if we were to threshold, we're going to leave out some people who deserve the loan and, and give loans to some people who maybe don't deserve the loan. So the blog post has this interactive feature that you can look at, and I encourage you to play with it, uh, where you can you can actually change the threshold and see what happens. So in this case, we have the threshold set at 50, and we can see there's four groups that are result that result from this. Right, there's the the gray group, gray groups. The lighter gray is the people who are de denied the loan and who would default. So those, you can think of those as like the bank did, made the right decision. Then the dark gray are the people who were denied the loan, but they would have paid it back. We just got it wrong, right, because we use the threshold model. So then on the blue side, we have people who are given the loan, and then the lighter blue people ha uh, don't pay their loan back, so the bank loses money on that. And then the, blue, the dark blue individuals, uh, you know, they get the loan and they pay it back, and that's the ideal case. 
So there's a bunch of statistics on the right that show you know how many of these were correct and how many of these were incorrect, and you can and you can also see the true positive rate, which ends up being the important factor that that they they care about the most here. Um, these are the people who deserve the loan, right? They're the people who would pay back, um, uh, and and then the fraction the fraction of those people who did actually got the loan. So in with the threshold of fifty, we get eighty three percent true positive rate. Which means that uh, you know, 17% of people were, you know, stripped of the opportunity to get this loan. So you can change the threshold on the website, and I, I've changed it to, to something like this. So 36. So in this case, we get perfect, true positive rate. You know, we get 100%. Everybody who deserved the loan gets the loan, but the bank loses a lot of money. Right? The bank loses money because it gives out way too many loans. A lot of these people don't pay back. And then the bank loses money on that. And then you can go the other direction where you don't make any mistakes the other way, where you don't give out, give out any loans to people who will not pay it back. And in that case, the true positive rate is tiny at 36%. Um, it's, it's just too selective, and we don't get a very good profit. So that's, um, so that's the setting we're working in. So the blog post continues to talk then to talk about you know, what happens if you have two populations? And these populations have different behaviors for the relationship between credit score and whether they'll pay, pay it back. And this can happen, this is based on some real, you know, real situations involving social groups and their relationship with, you know, the existing credit score systems, which are uh, pretty unfair as, uh, as they are these days. So in this setting, you can, or in this part of the post, you can interactively set the thresholds for each group separately. So there's a blue population and an orange population, and you can see their bell curves are a little different. And there's some default or some uh, preset settings. So one is the maximum profit. So you set the threshold for the first group to 61 and the second group to 50, and you get the maximum possible profit. But if you zoomed in, if you zoom in and look at the true positive rates for the maximum profit, you get that the blue group has a lower true positive rate than the than the orange group. So the orange group sort of you sort of just get a better chance of getting the loan if you're orange. And that's not really fair, right? We don't want that type of behavior. So another thing we might try to do is to use the demographic parity idea. And so that's where we're going to make the rate of per, of people getting the loan the same across the groups. So if you're a blue person or if you're an orange person, you have a 37% chance of getting the loan. So that's okay. Uh, the profit's a little bit lower, but and you get this kind of you know you get this kind of fairness uh, because the positive rate's the same, but the true positive rate's not the same, right? But that that means that if you're a blue person and you are responsible and will pay back the loan, you still have a worse chance of getting the loan than somebody who is a responsible person who will pay back the loan in the orange group. So the last setting is this equal opportunity setting, which chooses chooses thresholds such that the true positive rates are the same. Um, and, you know, I'm not going into the details of the algorithm that they propose in this paper, but they basically propose an algorithm that tries to achieve this true positive rate by uh, adjusting the predictions that come out of the model. So looking at the second case study, uh, there's another paper that was really important in this line of research um, called Learning Fair, Fair Representations. And this is a, a paper that tries to ensure that we represent the examples, the data, in ways that you, where you can't, you can no longer reverse engineer the sensitive attribute from the features in the data. So I'll show you a few, uh, some of the key figures or equations from the paper. So the definitions are that we have X, which is the entire data is entire data set of individuals and we have the sensitive feature s it's a binary variable and uh, we'll have you know different groups uh, x0 and x oh, or x0 is a training set and, uh, and we'll have x plus and x minus which are the subsets of the data that are in the sensitive or in the protected set or not in the protected set um, and then the idea is we're going to try to represent x as some you know not as x but as z so this is this is probably reminiscent of, of PCA, uh, but it's a little different than that. But the idea is that we're gonna we're gonna have these variables z, which will be our new feature vectors for x. 
So the goal is to get to this idea of statistical parity, which is that the probability of the value of z, given that x is in the protected set, is going to be equal to the same probability of z, uh, given that x is, in the, in, is not in the protected set. And the algorithm this paper goes into, which we won't dive too deep into, is, is just is, it tries to represent this each example x as this probability vector, as this, as this mixture of prototype vectors. So you might recognize the equation two as something like the softmax that we have seen, have seen in neural networks, or the multinomial logistic regression expression. And the learning goal is to find a mapping from the data space x to z that satisfies statistical parity, meaning that you know the probability of the z values is equal to you know, regardless of the sensitive feature, um, and the, that the mapping in Z space retains information in X so that it can still be used for a prediction, um, and then that the induced mapping from X to Y is close to F, uh, which I didn't define before. F, F is the desired classification function. So put simply, what this is trying to do is it's trying to make some new representation of the data that is fair because it, it you can't, uh, or because it, it doesn't, have a different probability based on the sensitive feature, but is still useful and accurate. So this is the math that they use in this paper for this objective function, um, uh, or for the learning objective. Uh, so equation four here, it breaks down into, into three pieces. So the blue piece, that I've, or the piece I've highlighted in blue, is the parity loss, the uh, representation for sensitive features versus non-sensitive features, or sensitive individuals versus non-sensitive individuals. The orange term, that's equations 8 and 9, uh, represent the, the quality of the, the reconstruction using the, the new representation. Or rather, the, it's the reconstruction error uh, once you reconstruct basing, based on the, the new representation. And the uh, last piece is the original uh, training loss. Right? So that's the cross-entropy term which uses a, a predictor, a linear predictor, uh, based on the, the M uh, features. And if you look at the results from the experiments after they use this method, uh, they find that their method consistently gets almost zero discrimination, which, is, uh, which they measure by comparing the prediction average uh, for the sensitive group versus the non-sensitive group while only having a small drop in accuracy or uh, sometimes a negligible drop in accuracy. And here they compare against the logistic regression without any correction, uh, fair, naive, based, regularized logistic regression, and then their method. So the last uh, case study I want to go into is this recent paper from a year ago uh, when I'm recording this, um, a year ago from when I record this. So this is a paper on fixing the feedback loop problem in machine learning where you have, uh, if you have a deployed problem or de deployed machine learning algorithm, you will actively affect the people you're learning about because you sort of, you know, provide some predictions based on your pre learned model and then uh, those predictions affect your users and then you relearn from the user data. So how you treat the users might actually affect your training data for future steps. So the authors of this paper develop a, a dynamics model that captures how the the risk of a learned model or the expected error of a learned model will affect the user retention uh, for different groups and the idea is that these groups are sort of not not predefined um, but we know that we assume in the model that they exist and and then they can use this dynamics model to run a bunch of simulations so they, they ran a simulation that's shown in figure one here where they have two groups, one group on the left and one group on the right. And initially, there's only a slight amount of unfairness, and you can't really even see it. Um, but the idea is that initially, there's a, maybe a slight preference to, uh, or there's a slight overrepresentation of groups of users from the left cluster. And eventually, that gets amplified to form a new data set that contains slightly more users from the left and then that gets trained uh, or the model gets trained based on the data set and then that makes predictions that then further pushes out users from the right group and eventually you're just left with 
a data set that, that is almost all users from the left group, and then you get, you know, at time step 500, so that's what the T equals 500 means, at time step equals uh, 500, you get a model that's almost, almost only serving the users on the left and completely ignoring the users on the right. So the authors of the paper proposed an, an algorithm they call, uh, I believe it's called distributionally robust optimization. Yeah, distributionally robust optimization, um, which uses the, the constrained optimization up here in equation four. Um, so it's looking for you know, the best uh, model that, uh, relative to this risk, this distributionally robust uh, risk that is, that, that is also at the same time searching for the worst subgroup um, that is uh, being, or the worst subgroup that, that, that has the worst loss, subject to that subgroup being defined by a distribution, which is similar to the true distribution. So that's what that, that uh, calligraphy B term is. It's, it's, a, it's a region close, it's a distribution that's close to the original distribution. So with some you know fancy duality analysis, uh, they get equation six, which is the new objective function, which um, they can then use. A, there's just a single scalar term eta that they can just search for with a grid search or other search algorithm. I forget exactly which algorithm they use, but okay. So they actually so this is the algorithm. It's, it ends up being having this like nice elegant perspective where it's just sort of like slightly adjusting the loss function but it has a uh, but they do a really cool analysis uh, evaluation of this algorithm where they actually use users real users who are participating in a study where they're uh, being provided a machine learning service and then get given questionnaires to, to decide whether they would continue using that service and they group these people into different categories by giving them different tasks so one group is given a task where they're supposed to write, they're supposed to rewrite tweets uh, that are written in African American English, and the other group is given the same task but with standard American English uh, tweets. And the idea is, regardless of what the user's own sort of native dialect of English is, uh, because they're being asked to type out these tweets in, in, in you know, exactly matching the original tweet, um, you know, whatever type type of tweet they've been they've been assigned. Uh, the system that they're using would be more useful and more convenient if it understands the dialect that they're being asked to write. So the system that they're working on was with, with these autocomplete, uh, so, so they're given an autocomplete tool that will make their task easier. Um, and the idea is, you know, you can just imagine if, if you are uh, typing out a tweet in African-American English and the uh, autocomplete tool only provides standard American English, so it ignores the grammatical structure uh, typical in AAE, then uh, it won't be as useful. And, if, and it might actually be uh, intrusive, right? It might actually get in your way if, uh, if, it's, if it's trained to speak the wrong dialect that you're trying to type. So if you look at the results from their experiment, they, you know, again, these are run on real users, uh, they find that the, if you use ex, uh, empirical risk minimization, so without their corrective approach, without this distributional or robust approach, um, you see that the users assigned AAE, uh, they, they get lower and lower user satisfaction over time. And this is a result of the, you know, the data set essentially representing fewer of these users and then the model being trained to satisfy the majority group, which will be the standard American English group. Uh, and in subplot B, you can see that the user retention uh, also uh, drops significantly for the ERM approach for the African American English group. But if you use their approach, the, the uh, distributionally robust optimization approach, you see that you get these flat lines, almost flat lines everywhere, where the user base stays roughly equally balanced as it was in the first stage, so you don't get this sort of feedback loop effect where something gets worse and worse over time, which is a pretty good evidence that their approach is working um, at least the way that they intend it to. So these case studies were papers from you know recent machine learning uh, research conferences. So the first one was published at NeurIPS 2016, uh, the second one was published a couple a few years earlier at ICML 2013, and the feedback loop paper was at ICML 2018. 
So this should give you a flavor of some of the types of problems we we are trying to solve in the machine learning community, but it probably also gives you a sense that of how difficult this whole task is, right? It's not it's not so easy to first formulate a a useful and effective concept of unfairness and then come up with a method to try to correct that. So throughout this video I've been, you know, talking about different ways of measuring unfairness and ways of trying to correct for unfairness, uh, causes of unfairness. Um, but just some overall general thoughts I have on this topic is that, is that this issue of fairness and um, machine learning is really something that, that takes, I, I think, a, a, a dedication and um, a lot of expertise in, in social issues that a lot of sort of computer engineers and scientists may not have the time and attention to, to fully understand. So as a result, we might not be able to solve these things, or for some of us, some of us might not be able to solve these things by, by ourselves. But what we can do is what we, we can design tools. Right? That's what technology experts are really good at, is designing tools. And so we can design tools to try to prevent technology from doing wrong. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily say, oh, you must use this tool. But we should at least try to design these tools because it would be a bad idea for us to say, because we don't know how we should apply these tools, we're not even going to bother trying to develop them. Um, and so some of these tools might be these things I've shown you where we try to have algorithms that reduce unfairness. But another type of tool that would be really useful is something that allows better understanding of the decisions that machine learning algorithms are making. So that's these, there's a lot of work on trying to make machine learning algorithms more transparent or have explainability or interpretability, which all have subtle uh, different, subtly different definitions, but the general goal is just to be able to open up a machine learning algorithm and understand what went into the decision making of that algorithm. And then if you give that ability to understand the decision making, you give that ability to, to uh, policy makers or social scientists or, or government representatives, um, then they can, you know, using their expertise and, and dedication towards social good can use these tools to try to improve the impact of machine learning on society. Um, and, and that would be good. It would be good if we can do that. Now, I will, I will say, you know, I wrote here that the current trajectory, so I'm recording this in 2019, um, the current trajectory is not good, right? It's bad. Uh, we have a lot of people working on corrective research, but it's we're not we're not really making enough prog at least in my this is my, in an opinion I can't I can't actually make a factual statement here but but my opinion looking at what I'm seeing is that the rate at which machine learning is infiltrating our lives and being deployed in so many different ways that's moving much faster than the work that we and other researchers in the field are doing to try to make sure that these things can be made to be fair. So I think this does need to need to change or else we're going to run into a lot of trouble. And there's there's almost a pushback against this kind of work that I see sometimes which is that people people say that oh, you know, machine learning you know, you shouldn't need to correct for unfairness in machine learning because machine learning is just a bunch of math. So how can math be unfair? And and the simple response to that is that you know, math yeah, is is de dealing with a lot of numbers and numbers don't have you know any fairness, but numbers represent something, right? And these numbers are, are used to represent something from the real world, and therefore they can they can have unfairness. They can be unfair, right? It's not just it's not as simple as just saying oh because we're using numbers it's going to be fair. I mean of course you can be unfair with with using numbers. That'd be something like saying that like sound waves are just sound waves, so you, you can never do something unfair if you're just making sounds but of course you make you make you can use you can make language with sounds and language can be you know represents real world things that can lead to unfairness so in the same way math is a language that can be that can do things that are unfair and so machine learning can also be part of that so we should definitely be thinking about how machine learning can be made more fair you know what pitfalls we might fall into and how to avoid them so I hope this video gives you a, you know, an, an idea of what's going on in this space. There's, like I said, there's a lot of work on this area uh, and a lot of problems to solve. And of course, I've I've barely touched on all the things that we need to be thinking about with this with this topic.